we're live. <laughs> we are. We're back. <laughs> we're back again on a Sunday at 7 p.m. I feel like I want to do a little rap. <laughs> come on, do it. Come on, come on. <laughs> we're back again on a Sunday. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to Fran and Friends podcast on Spotify. As you know, on Sundays, we're doing a parenting series called the game of parenting and how to play it, where we share stories about uh, psychology uh, experiences that we've had in our own lives, uh, in addition to some things that we have researched that could help parents that might be looking for some tips on how to become a better version of themselves so they can become a better parent for their children. So today's topic, we are talking about motivation. <laughs> yes, and with each motivation, based on the few episodes we have we had before. So as a start, we were talking about relationships and how we can build healthy relationships with our kids. But then we thought that to build that healthy relationship, we need to understand ourselves and master who we are, understand where we come from, in order for us to do to build that healthy relationship. Then mm -hmm. we moved into nurture or nature because we always heard people saying oh i was born that way yes we were born with certain traits but we also develop other traits from our parents and the environment we're in and that was our third episode and today we're going to talk about change we're going to talk about how to do the change and mm -hmm. then we will recap a bit on what we learned last week but okay. at the same time we're going to talk about motivation and although we all want to change, what is standing in the way of our change, which is basically motivation and how we all lose motivation, although we know that this is the change we want to make. Mm, uh, I love it. I definitely need that in my life right now. <laughs> yeah. So, so going back to last week a bit, just to recap uh, how we talked about how we were, how our behavior forms, how our brain works. And I remember talking about uh, the mind and the brain. So we, we'll talk more about it today so we can get people who are listening to us who feel stuck in their parenting and they feel that really they lose control of their words, of their actions, what's really happening inside and mm. how we can sustain the change. Because for me, like if I talk to my sisters, if I talk to my friends, my kids, everyone wants to improve something in their lives. But as they are attempting to change, soon enough, they, they lose the motivation. An example, if now whoever is, ask, is listening to us, we ask them this question. What was your New Year's resolution? And Ooh. how long did it take to break it? Oh my God, did they say something about that? Only, what, 30%? Is it 30 or 13% of the people that actually... Um, I, I really they... don't have don't <laughs> have any information, but what I know, it should be more than 30% because most of the people are who are around us, they don't continue the, the resolution. Mm -mm. So there's a very small portion of people that continue with their resolutions. And that's for, for many, many, many reasons. But for, for, first, let's go back and talk about our behavior, mm -hmm. how we really took this behavior, how we developed this behavior. So as we were talking, we said between zero and seven, we have a blank slate, okay? We have a consciousness that is um, not working. We compared it to a mobile phone, you remember? We yes. said with a mobile phone, if we have a touch screen, but we don't have applications, the touch screen doesn't work. So mm -hmm. your conscious mind cannot take decisions if the applications are not there. Mm -hmm. Who puts the application? We, as parents, them as manufacturers decide about the society, what everyone needs, and they start putting all these um, applications in the mobile. As parents, we believe that there are certain things that our kids need to know 
for in order for them when they reach a certain age to be independent in order to use it right and these information are actually um, received by observation so a child from zero to seven is looking at their parents um seeing how they behave so most of the time you would you would say oh yeah i'm i'm angry all the time i took it from my parents it should be in my dna mm -hmm. i believe anger is one of the things that you learn through observation oh, so yeah. if your parents are angry all the time which means they have uploaded an anger application in me <laughs> that i can use it at the age of seven i start so when we say ages yeah it's roughly it could be five it could be eight depends on the development of the person but in general around the age of seven kids want to be to start feeling that they know they want to put what they know into application mm. this goes back to what you were talking about dima how um they they have a program here called first five where yeah the ages from like zero to five are the most impressionable. And then you were talking about, I think the theta stages and the yeah. how subconsciously, um, those are the most, I guess, impressionable years where we develop whatever it is that we're observing in our either conversations or in the environment that we grow up in. Those are some of the behaviors that we'll continue to take with us for the long haul. Exactly. And when we take them at, at around the age of seven, we start applying them. If I'm talking to a friend, I might be angry. I might try to smoke if my parents are smokers. Mm. I might go to the toilet and try. And guess what? I did that. So when I was, I think when I was around <laughs> seven, I was in the village back in Lebanon. Um, like the Lebanese people up until today, they really smoke a lot. Oh. And seeing all the old people smoke at that time, we took a cigarette, me and my two cousins, who happen to be here now, um, a, a match. We uh, we tried to to light the 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 cigarette, mm -hmm. and we dropped the match on uh, dried grass, <gasps> and the whole mountain where we were was burnt. And until today, they cannot really plant anything in it <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> so so this is and yeah they are little kids but they are little kids who are seeing parents mm -hmm. do things we as kids interpret things that our parents do in a different way we don't have a sense of safety we don't have a sense of security all what we know, they are our role models and we're going to follow them till the end. We're going to imitate them. So from 7 to 12, we are imitating, imitating. And guess what? Most probably those people are still around and they are repeating the same behavior. So by 12, we graduate and our we can use our touch screen fully without any guidance. Right. Now we're on okay. auto, autopilot. Yes. However, we see our friends and they come from different systems. Mm -hmm. And this is where a strong relationship with our parents will get us to be protected from the bad influence and will get us to be open to learn something new for someone that we see as something a bit more advanced than what we have. Mm, I think so you see? I was thinking about, you know how we have the inner child, the inner critic, and then the inner parent. Like, wow, yeah. how important it is to have this established, um, I guess, downloads or these established behaviors at that time. So that way when we are out in these different spaces, whether it be college, work, um, not that we want to be shifted in our mindset, but if it doesn't make any logical sense or if it if, if it doesn't work for what is in our favor um, or what is good for us, then we can counteract that with things that we've learned from when we were little. Yes. And if we don't like what we were, um, what, what we were taught, right. what's going to happen at some point, and they call it in psychology, um, cognitive dissonance. 
mm. which means I believe in something because I was born to believe in it. My parents just impose it over and over again. And at the same time, I'm seeing something else that I really relate to, but I cannot break free from that. And I, I'm always living this conflict inside. And there are so many people living this conflict because their relationship from the start, and I will always go back to the first point we discussed on this podcast, is the relationship. Because mm -hmm. that relationship, if it was nurturing, it is really protecting our children from the inconvenient influence because why i use inconvenience mm. and not bad what's bad for me might not be bad for someone else right i know universally we have the, the peace and the truth and the love and all of that but still if you were born in a place where you're treated in a very bad way all the time your guiding principle is being bad mm. so what we're talking here is there are going to be all sorts of influence and we really want to protect our children by building those healthy relationships by going out of the autopilot as parents and choosing the way we want to behave with our kids in order yeah. for them to be the best version of themselves. Mm. What is it when, uh, let's say we have two kids, right? Two kids growing up in the same house, their fathers are drunkard. And then one of them grows up to be successful and the other one doesn't. Um, what, how does that cognitive dissonance, like, how is yeah. it, what is the application there? It's, uh, you know, I don't know if I mentioned it on this podcast or on my TV interview, but they asked, there was a father who was really drunk all the time and he had two kids. One of them was really good and one of them was really bad, <laughs> acting the same. And they asked the good one, why are you like that? He said, if I had a father like this, what do you expect me to be? And then they asked the one that is drunk. He said, if I had a father like this, how do you expect me to be? So, wow. you know, it's, it's, people are not computers. So it's not a coding system where you enter the formula and it works. Because it's the interaction with the parent, with the mom, with the dad, the environment at school, they might have the same environment. Here, if they have everything the same, maybe biologically, their genes were a bit different and they were a bit distorted in a way or another, or the person was genetically taking that uh, mm -hmm. from one generation, of, it's intergenerational. So he could, it could be intergenerational, but however, even if it's by nature you have this, it's the environment that will help you to get over it because we all know that the brain by now we all know before they didn't know that the brain is malleable and we can change even the impression i think that's how they call it. i'm not really a biological person but yeah. the dna can have different impressions that can get the person uh, change certain characteristics in their personality so oh. here it take us to, okay, whoever is, has been watching the all the episodes, like, okay, I've been doing this for so long, so how can I change? It's really hard, I've tried, and I'm not being able to, mm -hmm. all right? So let's talk about quickly about the, the mind and the brain and their relationships, so we can use that to see how the change is gonna happen. So. Yeah. If our mind, we talked last time, I think, as well about the mind and how the mind, you know what, maybe it would be helpful if I draw it quickly so yes. people can, can understand. So that's the mind, yeah? Yep. And the mind is, oh, now it's a, you know what, it's a mirror camera. <laughs> so this is the conscious mind, okay? And this is the subconscious mind. So the proportion here, if you see, it's really like, this one is really larger okay. than that. Right. This is 95% of our life, and this is 5% of our life. Mm. Okay? Now, the conscious mind is our planning, our dreams, our everything we don't know. The subconscious mind 
is our habits. Whatever we do regularly, talking, speaking, e uh, sorry, eating, walking, running, those are subconscious behavior because when we were born, we didn't know how to do them. And we learned with time to use our language, to use our hands, to use our legs, yeah? Now the subconscious is one million times faster than the conscious. So if, if my conscious mind is a processor of 40 ideas for per, per second, this one has 40 million ideas per second. That's crazy. Okay. So whatever is in our subconscious mind is actually guiding our behavior because when someone comes to me and does something to me, I immediately recall memories and knowledge that is stored and that's why how I react. Mm. But if something is happening to me for the first time ever, if I never drove a car, I'm driving a car and I have a car accident, the way I react is so different than the second time I have, a, I have a, an accident. So everything we do is a learned behavior. And when I say 40 million times means when I'm faced, so today we're talking about the change, yeah, the behavior of change. When I'm faced with two decisions, let's say, should I shout at my child or should I talk in a nice way and try to communicate with that child? Mm -hmm. If all my life I've been exposed to parents, to teachers, to people around me who lose their temper, that's the 40 million idea per second that's going to take over. And automatically, I won't have the time to choose my reaction it's going to choose me and I'm going to jump in and start shouting. Okay. So how do we undo that? <laughs> so we need to look deep inside and see what's happening. I need to be aware first. And that's in anything you want to change. You need to be aware. When are you losing your mind? When are you losing control of your, of your reaction? Yeah. So mm -hmm. we start noticing that and I want to I wanna call it, uh, you know what? <laughs> it's easier to go back to my book because I have the, I have the, the graph, which is really nice. I remember so that's what I'm talking about. I hope you can see it. That's oh, it. Okay. okay. So we yeah. see the conscious mind. We see the subconscious mind. So, Always we have two ways of thinking. I can, a thought comes. It's either negative or positive. Yeah? Yes. If I work on my subconscious, if my subconscious is like it was before and I have the tendency to be negative, automatically I'm going to choose the negative idea. Mm. Okay? So yep. we have the mind. And again, I'll go back to this one. This mind is connected to the body. Okay? That's the thought, that's the feeling, and that's the action. And we go back to the result. Mm. So oh, whichever wait. one has more influence is the one that's going to win. Exactly. The thought, if, if, I, if my conditioning is negative, then... Automatically, I'll jump into the negative thought, the thought the, which is going to lead to a negative feeling, and the negative feeling is going to lead to an action that is negative, shouting and, and blaming and like saying all these things that we don't want to, then the result, our relationships are gone. That looks so overpowering. Like, okay, you have all those odds, 400,000 versus the 40 impressions like yes they're a i guess an overriding of the system that can help us to um i guess beat the curve because that is a that's a lot of odds that we're fighting against yes indeed there is a <laughs> lot and and the only way to change is to reprogram your subconscious mind mm -hmm. in order for it to be working for you rather than you working for it. You will always work for it, by the way. But mm -hmm. if the program is positive, means you, you reprogrammed it 
in a way so when you're reacting naturally you react in a positive way let me give an, another example because i like examples they get people to think in a different way so first of all there's something called system one and system two so i'll take you now to a psychology lesson okay. system one is the subconscious mind system two is the con conscious mind when system one is working when sorry when life is happening if things are very familiar happening in a like on regular basis we always go to system one system two sleeps okay we're always reacting we're always on autopilot now we start something new we want like i had a problem with my friend and i need to solve it system two comes in if system one doesn't have any answers okay okay that's how the system two comes in now if the system one thinks that every conflict is bad there's no solution out of it then system two stays asleep and i start fighting with the person i cannot stop myself because I believe the knowledge and the memories and everything I have is the one that is gonna help me solve this problem. Got it. Okay, let's go to the example. I wanna drive a car. I can talk, I can walk, I can do everything, but I don't know how to drive a car. So now it's a system two uh, action. The system two action is 40 ideas per second, so it's slow. I need to train myself, I need the guide to train me, I need the instructor and then my parents and I do. And I start moving from system two to system one. Ah, so okay. my behavior is the same as driving a car. I start by being angry all the time and I want to learn my behavior to be someone who can control their feeling. So I get a guide. It could be a person in the family, or it could be a coach, it could be a psychologist. We don't know what you want to choose. But you choose that guide, and only at the beginning, you need that push. You need someone to help you understand what you're going through. And with time, you start applying it at home. You're not going to succeed from the first time. And that's why we say <laughs> it takes time. But you're going to feel much better because you are in control. So the application to override our our subconscious is to be active in applying the new techniques that we're learning, whether we're learning it from a book, whether we're learning it from a therapist, whether we're learning it from a counselor. It's just really more of the work. So that way, I guess it can create the new neurons that we need so that we yeah. can apply this uh, system one be so it can be transferred to the system one behavior. Exactly. It's, okay. It becomes a natural thing. So it becomes a learned skill, but that learned skill becomes a natural one because you're not using your brain anymore to apply it. Hmm. So for example, yesterday we were at the game of for my daughter, she plays basketball. Now they are still at the beginning, so they're not really mastering their dribble. So when they are in the court, and that's what I was, like you apply it even with athletes, yeah? Mm. They're frustrated because they're lost. They've lost. But I'm like, no, 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 wait. Your focus has been in the game on how to, can I control the ball. But in fact, if you don't know how to control your ball while you're closing your eye, instead of looking at the court and seeing the strategy and seeing which player is, is free, you're focusing down on the ball. Mm. So this is life. If a skill is not natural to you, although you want to learn how not to react to your kid's behavior, but you still haven't mastered it yourself about your behavior, then you're not going to be able to see what's happening and you're going to always be dragged into, in converse, into a conversation that you do not like mm. and you're going to lose your control and then you're going to regret what you said. I remember Abby sharing with me about um, a few steps that she does with their parents. And one of the main things that popped into my mind was noticing how our body is feeling. Yes. Especially if we have um, parenting skills that cause us to be more yeah. reflective. And yeah. um, anyways, she said, when we feel like there's a tenseness in our body or we feel yeah. like some type of 
if, if we find ourselves holding our breaths, that would be yes. a moment for us to give ourselves a pause to notice. And that would be the small, very small moment that we can help ourselves to self-regulate. Yes. That's and why that awareness. Micro, yeah, that, it's like a uh, micro education, right? A micro learning moment. Yeah. And, and that's why it's very important first before whoever is listening to us now, before you attempt to change anything, spend a week looking at your behavior, noticing when you lose it. But here we go into the triggers, we know into we go into what makes you so upset when someone says this, that, or the other. Yeah. So when you start contemplating yourself, you're gonna see it say, Oh, that's what's making me upset. And this is where next time you can actually Although you might not be able to control it all, you might be going like, ah, and then you hold yourself back. Yes, yes. And when you start, or you do it, you do the first time, you might talk, but at the end of it, immediately after you finish, you're like, oh my God. And this is where I tell parents, stop and say, I'm so sorry. Yes. Tell your child that you're so sorry because you lost your self-control, because you're gonna teach them how to act with their friends when they lose control. Yeah. So it's a process. It's a process of moving yourself from one type of thinking to another type of thinking. Totally. It brings me to my thought of me and my um, issue with my daughter when I was telling her about the trash can and how I had just this aching, like, feeling of like why don't you take the trash out like and then she goes mom why does it bother you so much that the trash isn't being taken out and like you said I had to figure out why because my mom would get angry if I didn't take the trash out and she's like well is that going to change anything if I don't take the trash out like is it going to change the world if the trash can is still there and I really had to come to peace with myself like okay this is really not a big deal i can approach this differently versus trying to yell at her about taking the trash out because that's uh, only going to create the negative feelings that we were talking about earlier of course and don't you think sometimes it's also not about whether taking the trash or not it's just because i want my word to be respected yeah and for yes. me i get my validation as a parent when my kids listen to me and follow my instructions religiously mm, yes and as a teacher as well because this applies to teachers as well teacher in a class so as a teacher or as a parent if you think about it our job is to equip these children to have tools that they can use as they are growing up to face the challenges of their lives, whether they are life challenges or people challenges, yeah? Mm -hmm. So by me all having this goal of being respected by words only, I don't think it's gonna equip the child to choose their reactions. Mm -hmm. So I would use, let's say that same example. If I really want my kids to help me do the stuff rather than follow my instructions, I could, even if the child doesn't believe that taking the trash now is important, mm -hmm. I can talk to my child and say, you know what? I like, I really like the environment to be uh, nice. And for all of us, we're living here. If we keep it, insects might come. It may, it might give a certain smell. And I really have so much to do. Can you please? do that part and help me. And you will be surprised how children react to feeling needed. Mm. So, so have them become part of the conversation. And you're right, because that's actually what happened. We had the conversation, then it went out of proportion. And then yeah. I came back, I apologized, and I came back with another solution, which yeah. how you introduced... I was like, well, you know, I would like our environment to be cleaner because when people do come in and visit, it would be nice for the house to be clean. And she had seen it my way after also to her siblings were like, yeah, man, 
you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's <laughs> always about relationships. Mm -hmm. It's always about appreciating what we have because normally, even us as parents, I'm not going to talk from the side of the children, but for us, mm -hmm. if our child is sick, we change all our behavior, we, chill, we change all our rules, and nothing matters except that. Right, right, right. So instead of waiting for these moments, always think, and that's my strategy in life, what if today is my last, is the last day of my life? How would, how would I like to change? How would I like it to happen? How would I like my day to end? How would I like to be prepared for whatever is after that? And this question, get the person to feel in peace and understanding that I'm not in a hurry. We're not in a hurry. Mm -hmm. It's taking it easy. And I'm not saying don't be ambitious because all the time, the people that are a bit like critical and they want answers they would tell me oh so why go to work if today is the last day of your life why do this why do that i'm not saying don't do anything i'm saying have your goals have your direction but one don't attach your happiness to the goal mm. two enjoy the journey while you're going to the goal and remember that you might abort today, and if you do, how do you like to spend the last day of your life? Wow. Wow. You see? So yeah. seeing things from this perspective makes our life much easier, and that's what parenting is all about. It's not about working, working, making money, providing the future for our kids, and <laughs> not being there. And whenever we are free to be there, the kids are grown up and they have their friends, they have their environment, and they don't have time for us. Mm. I really appreciate how you brought that up, Dima, because um, the journey of enjoying the journey, enjoying the learning experience, enjoying walking while you're learning whatever it is that you need to do to help yourself become that better version is an area where I think that, like you said, people are missing that that small little window because it is important to be present in the space that we're learning in because we could, like you said, abort or transition at any time. So learning how to be present in the space while you're learning, I think that would be good for both ourselves and the children to observe because when they also too find themselves in a space of learning by observation, that will also allow them to react the same way because they've seen, oh, okay, this is how mom or dad approaches learning. If they can do it, I can do it too because they showed me. Yes. And before I continue this, because I have the idea for the next time, so we can... Next time, we're going to talk about the importance of goals. We're going to talk because now when I want to change and we're going to see the different ways of changing. OK, I know I want to change and I know I want to um, to make that difference. But then I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to stay motivated. So goals, importance of goals, importance of loving myself so part of the things we talked about today like mindfulness spirituality compared i call them the prerequisites of change mm. okay Talk about it. so <laughs> so we know how we we know how now we're learning how to change but then okay i know how to change but what if i abort today so learning to live the moment but at the same time, be ambitious and have the goal, okay? Okay. So going back to what, what we were talking about, let's go quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking if I should talk about the mind or let's talk about the ways we can change and then we can have a detailed Wait. conversation about that. Yeah, yeah, let's talk so about the So the ways to change, you remember last time I said the theta 
is important to to understand the wave of theta because mm -hmm. if we are saying that the information got into us between the age of zero and seven because our mind our mind was open and it was, didn't have resistance how can you replicate that in our age at this time of our life so mm -hmm. you know how when you first wake up in the morning you're half awake half asleep wanting that time to wake up Mm -hmm. That's when our brain waves are on the same level as the one we had when we were younger growing up. Oh, okay. And the second one is when you put your head to sleep and you 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 got disconnected from the world, but at the same time, if you hear someone, you 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 can still hear someone. Mm -hmm. That's the not the other stage when your brain is at the same level at the sponge when we were from zero to seven. And that's that's the theta stage, right? Yes. And okay. this is why you hear people telling you, if you want to do a guided meditation or a self-hypnosis, do it at that time of your day, either mm. when you wake up or when you are going to sleep, because what's going to happen, your brain or your mind like your mind cannot resist the information because it is in that level so whatever you put in is going to be retained wow so like that's the state i i, I kind of call that like groggy right like you, when you're first waking up and you're like oh. yeah 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 <laughs> and then you put yourself back and you're you're yeah. half up yeah yeah, yeah. So, like this stage so i did it like when i was going through my own issues and i didn't find someone to help me i remember that i even wrote it in my book i wrote the name of the person in my book because it really helped me so there's this guy called michael seeley i guess he's an australian okay and he does a lot of self-hypnosis so what mm -hmm. i used to do i used to choose one subject let's say self-confidence or uh how to deal with negativity okay I Michael would put it, is his name? Michael Seeley, S-E-A-L-E-Y, -E -E on YouTube. Okay. He's, he's really big on YouTube. Okay. So I would put, he he speaks and he has a very nice voice and he starts as if he is introducing new ideas for you. Hmm. And it works so nice. I remember, uh, I'm going to share this. The first time I had a meditation was, it's called Meeting Your Future You. Oh, okay. And he took he took me like the, the conversation he does with you. He goes like, you're going to a train station. You arrive to the train station and you see that person very far from you. And that's the person like he gets you to visualize yourself in the future. Ooh. And funny enough, three years after that, I found myself going into a shop buying the same suitcase i saw in that meditation so just wow. to put context to it yeah i was working as an architect in dubai i was all the time wearing my boots my safety clothes everything like you know when you are on a site mm -hmm. in that meditation i dreamt that i was wearing like a white shirt that a silky shirt shirt with a um sorry shirt and a black skirt and holding a leather case with mm -hmm. all the files i have okay at that time i didn't know i want to do this yeah okay so i saw that woman i saw myself in that look three years later i left architecture and i was on the path of helping people and writing and going back to uni and studying and all of that wow so did you think when you were doing that meditation that you were still doing architecture at that time no no, no. i i switched off completely because you go into it i think in, you go into a space of desires mm. so you you lose control of your conscious mind and what's giving you Mm. And you go deep inside into that person that is sometimes hiding. I don't know if you've heard about Freud and his uh, his concept. I learned this 
now at, at uni. So Freud believes, I think, in three parts of the person. It's the id, the ego, and the superego. I hope yes. I remember my lesson well. Let's see. <laughs> the id, id, is everything, the desires that you suppress, mm. the things that you like to do, and they are sometimes the conscious and unconscious things that you like to do that are not acceptable by society. Mm. Okay? So they are the extreme things maybe. I don't know. Maybe. It, and he, he relates a lot to the sexual desires, to the things that people like to explore, but they are really afraid to tell someone, like, I would love to try that. It okay. gives me pleasure to think of that. Yeah? Yes. Then you have the super ego is the side of you that want to conform with the society so whenever you want to do something let's say and the ego is in between ego is always trying to find a balance between what's deep inside and what's fully externalized okay okay so the person has those things that are deeply deeply ingrained and they don't want to show it to other people. If that relates to what we're talking about. Okay. Okay. So looking at Fred and how he saw the human being, now we can understand a lot of times that there are behaviors that we cannot control because they are deeply seated inside. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So there, it's the... It's the unstated or the unrecognized desires that we have. Yes. Okay. Got you. Okay. So if if we look at that and then we look at the change we want to see and we are talking about how we as people want to change and want to make that change in our lives, then we have to stop and try to understand, as we said, being aware of our, our um, behavior, mm -hmm. understanding that whatever we went through and some unconscious desire could be responsible for the way we behave. Mm. And this is where we start changing what we're putting in, in order to achieve the change and become the best version of ourselves. Okay. So giving ourselves that expression of the things that we really want to do would help us to identify, um, I guess, a more meaningful way to grasp yes. on to this new change that we're trying to obtain. Yes. And by going, doing the hypnosis, doing the self-hypnosis, we're going back down. And when like self-hypnosis and listening to someone giving you those notes mm -hmm. will get you to go deeper inside and change some of the things that are creating what we call the dissonance. Mm. The dissonance, the um yes. the, the, the cognitive the, dissonance. The cognitive dissonance. Which yes. is having two different desires and you and you you're always torn between two of them. Mm. Have you heard of quantum jumping or quantum now I've heard of quantum science, but not quantum jumping. Okay, okay. All right. Well, that's for another time. <laughs> okay. Okay. So so hypnosis is yes. one of the ways where we can change. And it requires actually, it doesn't require a lot of effort, but it requires a certain expertise to apply it. So if you do it right, and I, I'm not an, a hypnosis, um, hypnosis uh, expert, but mm -hmm. I know very well that a lot of people who does it and they do it really well, you can go to a hypnotherapist and they can help you deal with stuff. You can tell them what you really want to change and you can share, share with them your story and they can help you reprogram in a faster way. Oh, yeah. I've, I've taken okay. a couple of hypnosis classes, but you're definitely yeah. right. And the things that you're talking about, like your subconscious and your conscious being, uh, you know, too two very different max or I guess two very yeah. different areas. Um, the, the thing that I thought that was cool that I took from that class is that if 
we are not vibrating on the same frequency of what we really want, the things that we really want to manifest in our lives won't come to pass because it's like you have two different energies coming together and they are they can't co-create. Yes. And you need the change you want to see or whatever you want to attract, like the law of attraction. Oh, mm -hmm. that's another, that's another. We need to talk about this in a, in a different one, maybe the third one. Okay. So we have the goals next time. The time after that, let's talk about the laws of nature. Okay. Because the laws of nature are really important, especially the one you mentioned now. Being on the same wavelength as what we desire will get us to be at the same wavelength as the opportunities we have, at the same wavelength as the people we want to have in our lives. Mm. So that could be a really long uh, conversation. But going back to how we can change, the second one is repetition. We said mm -hmm. that the, the, the child at seven takes that program and repeats it and repeats it and repeats it until it becomes part of their nature, moving mm -hmm. from system two to system one. Mm. It, it takes me to think, you know how when our parents are guiding us at those stages and if yeah. we have siblings that not yeah. even realizing that our siblings are the training ground for where we're using these belief systems from our parents whether they're yeah so if if they're manipulating and the parents aren't realizing that behavior is ma manipulation the child is using this behavior in the realm of their family home this is the training ground yes and then when they arrive to school, they're going to use it there. So yep. It's a good thing or a bad thing. They get in trouble. They don't get in trouble. So that's the system. Two ways to change our behavior. And there's a third one. I still didn't look into it, okay. but I heard about it. Ah, you heard about reading a book in two minutes. Super uh, learning. No. Oh, is that by so there is it? Sorry? Is that by Jim Quick? No, there's I, Bruce Lipton. Oh, have you yeah, heard yeah, of? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bruce mm -hmm. Lipton, I, I think he calls it Psyche. I don't know. Anyway, that third one is a completely new one. It's very recent where it's called super learning and they get, they have a way to impress your subconscious mind with, with, a series of things that you can immediately grasp. It's exactly, think about it this way. You want to change smoking. You don't, you can't really give up smoking. Yeah? Once mm. you know you have cancer, you stop it. Mm. This, similar to a shock, not, I don't know, I really don't know, but I know it exists. It's called, called super learning. And one of its application is you hold the book and you just flip it and you can have it all stored in your mind. What? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. But let's not talk, I, I just mentioned it, but let's go back to the two ways. Okay. So today we're talking about a parent who, who seems to be overwhelmed by their parenting. They don't know what to do. They're losing control of their kids. They, they're re losing control of their family because if one child starts making problems, the whole family will, will be scattered and mm -hmm. what we're talking about is a lot of time this kid is trying to connect with their parent parents in the bad way because the good way is not also working mm -hmm. and we always ask the parents to look at that relationship and say okay i am overwhelmed but maybe i can contribute to the solution by changing certain things because kids look up to us yeah yes and this is where we start discovering that the, we have certain ways. First of all, we might feel bad about ourselves. We might be guilty about our past. And this is the limitation that we have in our parenting style. So we work on ourselves first by changing our behaviors first and understanding where we come from. To change that behavior, if it's an anger behavior, if it's a, a controlling behavior, manipulating behavior, I need to go on a change. The change can happen in two levels. It could happen either by hypnosis 
by impressing our subconscious mind at a certain level where the, the subconscious mind is open, give it new information mm -hmm. that will help us work and use it subconsciously because it's changing. But again, even I believe even with the subconscious behavior, the mind needs exercise. It's a muscle. So you do the hypnosis, you go back home, and you need to know where you are so you can start doing that, uh, uh, that action. So if my child is talking to me, I try to breathe in, try to listen carefully and understand where they come from so I can help them. And this, even active listening, is a skill to learn bit mm. by bit. So either I go to hypnosis or I go to the other, other one, which is repetition, to build yeah. a new habit and move the system from a system two to a system one. And as human beings, we will always have new skills to learn and we're always in that, uh, that growth area. Yeah. Also, too, for the parents, to be kind to yourself, into the environment, your your environment that you're learning in with your child, because it can be frustrating. And so in the frustration to give yourself some self-compassion. Yeah. And like Ima was saying, like, take a little breather, take a little breath. It, this is a learning process. And anything that we are learning new has to be applied over and over and over again until be, we become more skillful at that particular skill. Yeah, and, and self-compassion is something we talked about in our second podcast. Mm -hmm. So I really invite people who are listening to us by chance today to go back and really listen to this while you're driving, while you're working, and your lunch break, because it's really helpful for our society. It's not only about your family. Trust me, we are graduating kids to this society. Mm -hmm. And if Many kids are protected from the mental health crisis we're dealing with today. It would be good for our society because they're going to be those people that are going to shine and create that ripple, ripple effect within their small circles. So, yes, we, we might not be able to change the world in one go. But look, Fran is in the U.S. I'm in Australia. I have family in Lebanon, in Dubai. Like, if we spread the word we really can make a change around the world by equipping these kids to be emotionally intelligent mm -hmm. in order for them to face life in a much fun way, I guess. Yeah, I like that word. Fun is good. Fun is yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes so, challenges are looked at, at as something that is not fun, but it can be if we reframe it. Yes, and that's where we where we go to the fixed mindset and growth mm -hmm. mindset. So the yeah. fixed mindset is no, 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 we can't change. No, 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 no. It's all about the no. And the growth <laughs> mindset is not I can change. I can do that change. I can be a better person. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dina, you always know it's great having you on the show, and I always look forward to our talks on Sundays. I'll check. I don't see anybody on here, but I do want to mention Zakia was saying, "Hey, hey, Zakia," <laughs> <laughs> and and really for for whoever is listening to us, they can later on, they can always reach out to you or to me and send the questions they have. They might some people might be relating to what we are talking about, but it's sometimes hard to share our stories in a public space. So we're always open. This podcast is really about um, supporting people, supporting parents. Even if you're not a parent, it could be supporting you to be a better parent. It could be supporting you to deal with your parents. So whatever you're going through, we're really open to listen to your questions and we can sometimes, if we have questions that are offline, we can re re answer them in the next episodes we have. Yes. So if you do have anything that you want to address, maybe your question will be selected for the next time. <laughs> well, everybody, thank you so much, Dima. Always a pleasure. And I thank will catch you. Up with you later. Bye, everyone. Okay. <laughs>